we'd like to spend some time talking about your faith sure. um, and, and your marriage, which, um, which you said is because of the grace, is the word you used, of a single uh, Supreme Court vote, your marriage to your husband, which you've also said has brought you closer to God. Yes. How has your faith guided you? How should voters and Americans expect it to guide you in decisions you make as you embark on this journey? Well, uh, I think in the presidential process, people need to understand us for everything that we are, and that includes getting a glimpse into our souls. Now, uh, I, I say this with caution because I also believe strongly in the separation of church and state. I believe that religion is never something to impose on somebody else, uh, and I believe it's important that anybody in politics can equally represent people of any faith or people of no faith. But I want people to know where I'm coming from, and where I come from is a Christian faith that teaches humility, that teaches love. Uh, the reason that being married to Chaston has made me a better person and uh, made me feel closer to God is that it has been that experience of caring about someone else more than you do for yourself and, and um, humbling yourself and putting yourself in your place. Um, I think that, that look, the, the scripture that I hear when I go to church is about compassion. It's about decency. Uh, it is fundamentally about the love that, that inspires us and compels us to look after the least among us, uh, not to glorify those who are already glorified, uh, not to uh, afflict the afflicted and comfort the comfortable, but the reverse. And that means looking after the, the poor. It means taking care of prisoners. It means welcoming immigrants. This is what, at least on a certain vision of Christianity that I believe in, uh, this is how salvation works. And you, you speak about your love and your marriage and your relationship in very inclusive universal terms. It's very at odds with um, a more identity politics vision uh, of, of politics that seems to be ascendant on the left. But what I'm interested to you is because you message it this way, um, it becomes inclusive. It emphasizes common ground. What kind of resistance are you finding, if any, on the campaign trail uh, from more socially conservative constituents or voters out there? Well, I think there are some who subscribe to a very different account of what faith means in politics. Uh, in my view, it's, it's one that might tug us back toward uh, some social conventions that uh, were enforced 2,000 years ago, got encoded in Scripture, mm -hmm. and that we have a responsibility to sort through. There are some things uh, about you know, wearing mixed cloth and, and, and for many of us uh, eating shellfish that, that we believe, while in the Bible, uh, are more reflective of the times in which mm -hmm. they were written than you know, the, the, the command of the Almighty. Not everybody views it that way. That's okay. That's yeah. the thing about dealing with Scripture. Uh, I just want people to know that, that my encounter with Scripture propels me to try, not always succeed, but try to be as compassionate, to be as humble, and to be as loving as possible. And that does, in fact, have implications for my beliefs about policy. Let's uh, address what the Vice President has said about you. Of course, the history here, for people who might not know it, you two worked together side by side, toured factories together uh, when he was governor uh, of Indiana. Uh, here's what he told our Dana Bash on Friday about this issue. Here it is. You know, I've known Mayor Pete for many years. We worked very closely together when I was governor, and uh, I considered him a friend. Um, and uh, he knows I don't have a problem with him. I. I don't believe in discrimination against anybody. I, I treat everybody the way that I want to be treated. I think Pete's quarrels with the First Amendment. Yes, All of us in this country have the, the right to our religious beliefs. Is your quarrel with the First Amendment, Mr. Mayor? The Vice President is entitled to his religious beliefs. My problem is when those religious beliefs are used as an excuse to harm other people. That was a huge issue for us in Indiana when he advanced a discriminatory bill in 2015 under the guise of religious freedom that said it was lawful to discriminate provided you invoked religion as your excuse. And I just believe that's wrong. This isn't about him as a human being. This is about policies that hurt people, policies that hurt children. And to this day, uh, if you listen closely to what he said, you'll notice that to this day he has not brought himself to say that it shouldn't be legal to discriminate against people in this country because they're LGBT. In most parts of this country, you can still be fired, denied housing, denied services because of who you are. He seems to be okay with that. I would love to see him evolve on that issue, just as he evolved or uh, I think sort of evolved on Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Remember, this is somebody who was against Don't Ask, Don't Tell because he felt it was too pro-gay. 
he wanted to make sure that even closeted members mm. couldn't serve. Okay, that's where he started out. Then he finally brought himself to say that people like me, while serving, maybe could be allowed to, to still wear the uniform unless we revealed that we were gay, and then we should be fired. That is a terrible policy, and my quarrel with the vice president is over that. And so you're, you're, you would be calling on the vice president to address those. Does he still support them? Because... Yeah, he's going to clear that up. Look, everybody, I think, you know, part of faith, right, is that all of us can, can evolve and can grow better. Maybe he will evolve to eventually believing that it shouldn't be lawful to discriminate against people for being gay. And if he makes that development, I, I, would, I would welcome that and, and I, would, uh, I would praise that. You have spoken a little bit about wanting children. Yeah. And recently, this week, you said you're interested in starting a family soon. And I think this is a relevant question because I see how much having children has changed me, not only as a person, but in my career, in my vision and hopes for this country. And for you, running for the highest office in the land, undoubtedly having children will change you. Can you tell us a little bit more about how you plan to start a family, the discussions with your husband, adopting, surrogacy, and what, what people should expect? Well, we, we've been thinking about it for a while. Yeah. Um, obviously, my recent <laughs> professional choices have made it a little more complicated. So we're figuring all, all, through all of that. We're also not wealthy. And, and it turns out this is, uh, I mean, parenting is an expensive proposition for anyone. Um, but especially for, uh, for a same-sex couple, th there's a lot you got to figure yeah. out. Fostering, uh, adopting, yeah. surrogacy. But surrogacy is also very expensive. It's Fair. also not legal everywhere, right. the same laws don't apply for same-sex couples everywhere. Right. I mean, what I know is that, first of all, my husband, Chaston, will be an amazing father. Uh, he's, he's great professionally as well, but I can't wait to see him as a parent. I, I will be trying to live up to, to his example on that. Uh, I also know that it's another one of those experiences um, that, that I think, you know, the things that happen to you when you care for somebody more than for yourself. Mm. And I, I can just... Knowing what that's like in our marriage, I can scarcely imagine what it's like yeah. as a parent. But I know that it would make me a better person, and I imagine it would make me a better president. Yeah. Y your mind will be blown, so. Right? <laughs> right? Now, all, all, all the cliches are true, and it is like having your heart walk around outside your body, yeah. as President yeah. Obama once said. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about the diversity of your crowds, and obviously the diversity of the Democratic Party. That's something you addressed, uh, I think, uh, quite recently, is something there's room for improvement on. Yeah. Um, your support has come from very wealthy uh, uh, voters within the Democratic primary. Uh, what is your strategy to address that? Well, I think we need to do better. You know, as I've been on the trail, we found, to some extent, it depends on geography. We, we had a, a very uh, diverse crowd at my first stop in Nevada, but less so in South Carolina. And one of the most important things you can achieve in South Carolina is engage with African-American voters in particular, sure. uh, which represents sh such an important part uh, of our party's coalition. Are, are you disappointed that the crowds have not been more diverse? Well, I just think it, it means we've got our work cut out for us. Okay. We need to invite more and more people into the process. We, we do it through our team and the team that we're building. And this is my approach in South Bend, too, which is a very diverse community. We're about 40, 45 percent non-white. Yeah. Can you just tell us how specifically you're going to reach out to African-American voters in a way that they really feel included and yeah. as though you're fighting for specifically what those individual voters need? Yeah, so part of it's substantive, making sure that we're addressing issues that disproportionately affect families of color. That's uh, present in the conversations around housing, around income, entrepreneurship, especially in the African-American community, is one of the best tools we have to grow economically, opportunity uh, for people of color, uh, and also criminal justice reform that, that touches so many families mm. of color. And uh, part of it's substantive, but part of it's organizational. It's why we're uh, working to build a diverse team within our organization. And some of it's quantity time, right? Where do you go on these uh, on these campaign visits. And there are very traditional and important places where you can engage uh, voters yeah. of color from uh, uh, church networks to, uh, uh, to some of the associations that have built up around the, the search for justice. But also, there's a bit of a gener generational divide here. Mm. Uh, younger people of color are less likely to organize in some of the traditional structures uh, that would have been true for my parents' generation. And that's where digital organizing and reaching into different uh, media venues is going to be so important to make those connections. There's the generational change argument again. Uh, before you go, you're in the surreal position of having, as Poppy said, come from being someone who was not on the national radar to being in the top tier of candidates. And that brings with it its own surreal spectacle, including late night shows. We wanted to get your reaction to Jimmy Fallon's skit about you just the other night. Take uh -oh. a look and respond.
By age 14, I knew I wanted to be president of the United States. And boy, the two years since have just flown by. <laughs> I'm a Rhodes Scholar, a lieutenant in the United States Navy, and the two smartest kids in the world stacked on top of each other. I was so qualified to go to college, Harvard bribed me to go. That's how I got the nickname, the reverse Aunt Becky. <laughs> Nowadays, most of you recognize me from the rallying cries of hope and unity that I've stirred across the nation. But the rest of you know me from my hit series, The Boy Who Became Mayor, only on Disney Channel. I had not seen that. Oh, you hadn't? Oh, even better. Yeah, that's great. I mean, you know, it's, um, it's fun, especially when, it, when it's playful like that. Um, of course, the other thing that starts happening when, you, when you, uh, your profile grows is people start uh, uh, trying to figure out if you're really what folks say you are, and, and mm. they start looking for uh, vulnerabilities and, and, and weaknesses, and you have to answer for, for those yeah. as well. 